I just don't want to do it. It's, I'd rather do it tomorrow morning. What? Well, what, what stories you want? What do you, you know? Trading stories. Well, what, you know. Um, what was your best day? The best, uh, well, there's a, there, probably one of the, uh, one of the most interesting traders that I ever worked with uh, was in the bond pit. And, um, and I worked with him for quite a while. And uh, I'll give you something, I'll, I'll give you an example of when I said that, that it's your state of mind that will determine your results as opposed to the amount of time that you expose yourself to, to the market or the opportunities. Um, you could say that, I mean, this guy, he loved to trade. And, and he was, um, back, in the, uh, back in the early 90s, one of the biggest traders in the bond pit. I don't know if you'd know his name or not if I said it, but uh, he, he wasn't as big as Baldwin. But there, there would be times, his, his largest position he put on would be about 5,000 contracts, futures contracts. And, but his normal position was between three and 500 contracts. So uh, a contract, one contract in, in uh, Treasury bond futures, a one tick move, a, the smallest incremental move in Treasury bond futures is worth $31.25. So 100 contracts would be 3,125 or 3,100, $33,125, and uh, 500 contracts would be over $15,000. So his normal, let's say, if you put on 500 contracts, his normal position between three and 500, one incremental change in price was worth about 15 grand in or out of his account. And you know, you can, the bonds, especially back then, they could easily move 10 ticks in a matter of seconds. So you're talking $150,000. And, and, and you could easily be subjected to eight to 10 tick price vacuums, either for or against you. So you're talking $100,000, $150,000 in a matter of moments. And like I said, there were times where he put on thousands of contracts, not just hundreds. So, you know. Uh, Would he uh, scale trader? Scale, scale trader? trader? Did he scale into his positions as differentiation from scaling out? Well, he, let's, Sometimes he'd take on the whole pit practically. Okay. And it was, he, I, I had many other clients in the bond pit who, who watched him and said that there were times it would be like watching Michael Jordan trade bonds. He was good, he was really good. And it was also that he just loved what he was doing. He loved being there every moment. It was hard for him to leave. And, um, and he really didn't give a shit about the money. And the money was truly irrelevant to him. In fact, out of all the people I've ever worked with in my life, I've never met anybody who was on the extreme, I mean, way over here in terms of how little money meant. Just didn't matter. But he had other problems. <laughs> um, when I met him, it was in, uh, in uh, May of 1992. Uh, he had a real bad day. Someone he ran into had come to one of my workshops and said that he should call me. He did. We had an appointment. Didn't really. In fact, we had a couple of appointments, and uh, not really much happened. He he just you know I I tried to explain some of this material to him, and he wasn't uh, he wasn't really into it or even grasping it for that matter. So uh, uh, I didn't hear from him for another couple of months, and I actually didn't hear from him at all. I heard from his wife, who called me. I never even met her. And she called me and she was hysterical because they're gonna, he was gonna have to mortgage the house because of a bad day that he had. And when I met him in May of that year, 1992, he had approximately $10 million flow in and out of his account from January until May. That's the kind of swings that he was on, okay? $10 million in and out like this, okay? The most he'd ever accumulated at the end of any given year was about $600,000. That's the most he's ever been able to keep, up to that point, anyway. So uh, she was really hysterical and uh, wanted to know what I was going to do to you know, fix her husband. And I wasn't even really working with him. And so we started working together, and working together on a uh, real consistent basis, virtually every day. And, um, and that was in July of 92. And so by ju from July of 92 until the end of December, he had, uh, he had five and a half million dollars. And then he went on vacation with his wife, 
and on vacation bought this book called The Coming Collapse of the either the bond market or the interest rate market and bought into the concepts in the book and from when he got back off from vacation that year bond market was in one of the biggest rallies that it ever sustained of all time and every day he was going in thinking the market was going to collapse based on what he read in this book that wasn't an accident by the way in terms of everything else that was going on in his life and by the middle of March of 1993 he was so desperate over the fact that he would lost just about oh, about half of the five and a half million dollars he was down to about 2.2 million that he and I was telling him virtually every day because we were talking almost every day sometimes for an hour a day you know you know this is what the way you need to think this is what you need to do this is how you you know fix the situation he just wasn't listening until one day he called up and he said okay I'll do anything and he meant it I'll do anything and so he and I said here's what you've got to do I've noticed that you're you're capable of staying properly focused about a half an hour a day that's it and so if you want to fix the problem you only get the trade a half an hour a day what was his first response well it was really tough because he just loved doing it and it wasn't just a matter of him loving to, to be in that pit because of the way of life that 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 it provided him it was like there's a work ethic in the futures pits there really is I mean it's like the other where you stand it, it, where you stand in that pit is very important there are territorial constraints and you know territorial let's say uh, dynamics involved because if you're not in your spot and, and you're not in your spot all day long it means someone else is going to take that spot and and these guys do get into territorial wars all the time I mean I've worked with traders who get into these territory wars about where they want to stand and and each one of them gets there you know like 10 minutes earlier every day until they're like getting there at 3 or 3 30 in the morning until one of them one of them eventually gives up you know and that's and, and they, they go through this a, a lot I mean this is not uncommon at all you know they're, they're basically got this range war going for this one little square foot of, of where to stand so uh, so there wasn't just that it was it was also also the work ethic in other words when you trade when you you have access to order flow in other words the kind of order flow that's coming from off the floor you know a lot of that a lot of that order flow is is not really trading it's virtually free money do you know what I mean by free money it's, it's riskless that's really what most of the locals in the pit are looking for they're looking for the riskless free money in essence what you're doing is that and, and they're not always legal trades by the way because all trades are supposed to be open outcry but what if you're standing next to a, a floor broker that has access to, uh, to order flow of both buys and sells and their market orders coming into the pit and there's a spread of one to two ticks between you know between uh, the bids and the offers well if I've got a hundred if I've got an order to buy a hundred contracts at the market and you know the bid is uh, the bid is 08 and the offers uh, and the offer is 10 well I'm going to be you know I'm going to be selling them I'm going to be selling them uh, or buying them at the bid and selling them at the offer to my to my buddy standing next to me now that's a two tick spread on a hundred contracts you just made 200 ticks was there any risk because he's going to take the other side of both of both orders he's all you got to do is card it up his buddy's okay card it up a hundred okay you bought you bought a hundred at eight you sold them at ten where's the risk see that's not trading that's just basically free money now you got to pay a price to get into those situations it's not as easy as you think because you know the guys that are controlling that kind of order flow they they expect favors in return it's it's just not just not that simple but what well, you name it <laughs> you name it it's an extreme environment you name it anything your imagination can think of is is about was about what it what it what it entails uh, but anyway, that, but, but it's not just that. It's not that and I'm not saying even implying that, that he had access to a lot of those trades. He really didn't even need that because he was really just a good trader in terms of, in terms of his ability to be able to perceive you know, where the direction of the market was and, and, and what he needed to do. Was there a particular time that he traded? Oh, I'm going to get into that. Okay, okay and that's, that's really part of, the, that's part of the whole story, as a matter of fact. It's an important part of it. In that, like I said, he loved being down there. He loved doing what he was doing. 
but at the same time, his ability, now, his ability to remain, remain properly focused was about a half an hour, an hour at the very outside. The rest of the day, he was just all over the place. So, and you gotta keep in mind one thing, when you're trading at a level where each tick might be worth $15,000 or more, it doesn't take much to screw up. Now you're standing in a pit, you've got, you've got literally, you know, I don't know how many guys can stand the bond pit, over a thousand I think, and you know, they're all screaming, they're all in close proximity to one another, they're, they're jostling with themselves, they're screaming in your ears, you're getting pencils poked in your, in your body, your face or whatever, there's all kinds of bodily smells going on, there are guys who do not want you to make money, okay, and will purposely, purposefully distract you, there's a lot of things that the, that the order fillers do to, to draw, to suck people into a trade, big locals, you know, to take the other side of a trade where they know for a fact that, you know, that, that someone's going to hit the market with a huge bid or offer to, to, they're sucking you basically what they virtually know is a losing trade. So, and not only that, it's like if, if you're in one of these trades and there are bids and offers that you're leaning against to get, you know, to get in or out of a position, and let's say you're in a position and, you know, there are bids and offers available that you can hit to, let's say, get out of a trade, out of a 500 lot trade at a two or three tick profit, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, just someone says, hey, and you turn your head and those bids or offers disappear. And next thing you know, there might be two or three ticks lower. Now you're looking at a scratch where you had a, had, had, had a you know, like on a 500 lot trade, you had 1,500 ticks available to you. Now you've got zero. You're gonna scratch a trade or you're gonna think you're gonna get your, your, your three ticks back, okay? Or now it's one tick against you. Now you got 500 ticks against you. Now, you, now you're at a 500 tick loss, 1,000 tick loss, 1,500 tick loss. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And you're thinking about, oh, I, if, I just, if I just hit that damn bid for the three tick profit. Okay, all it takes is just this, just, just this momentary, just, just, that's all, that's all it takes. And so his ability to stay completely focused in what he needed to do and when he needed to do it, like I said, was about a half an hour a day. And so that's what I said, you want, you want to stop this, then just trade a half an hour a day and find something else to do with the rest of your day. And he was so desperate that he did it. Um, no, wait a minute. Go ahead. Go Most ahead. people to, to stay at that level, it's just your body's working on it, it's such extreme uh, sense of awareness that it is hard for a lot of people. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Even longer than that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's, it, it would be like, it would be the equivalent, well, when I'm, when the kind of stuff that he did w was equivalent to, to, if you can imagine, being uh, in, in a, the seventh game of an NBA playoff, okay, the, the score is tied and there's one minute left. Okay, you're talking intense. Every day. Every yeah, day. this is every day, right. This is every day, all day long, intense. So, and, and, in, and, in, and in trading in the zone, there's, a, there's, a, there's an analogy that I use where it's like, like someone building a bridge over the Grand Canyon, okay? Like when you're trading just one futures contract, you build a bridge over the Grand Canyon, it's like, okay, the bridge is, you know, the bridge could be as wide as this room. What's the, what's the, what's the possibility, what are the possibilities I'm gonna walk over this bridge and I'm gonna fall off? You know, even if I'm, even if I, you know, like I'm staggering, okay? Like, you know, it's like I got a lot of room, a big margin for error, right? Now, I could fall off and, you know, the next, next stop is a mile down. But as you start trading in higher volume, meaning that as your contract size grows, that bridge, the equivalent of that bridge basically narrows. Narrows to the point where you're trading 500, 1,000, 2,000 contracts. You're basically on a tightrope. Okay, now you're on a tightrope over Grand Canyon. And what does it take to knock you off? Well, uh, if you're on the tightrope over Grand Canyon, it could take just not even, a, not even a, a very hard breeze, but a relatively gentle breeze might cause you to lose your balance and fall off. That gentle breeze in the pit is the equivalent of one distracting thought. That's it, just one distracting thought. He went ahead and, and did this. And he said, well, what, what half an hour of the day should I trade? And I said, you'll find it won't make any difference. Pick any half an hour that you want. Because regardless of what half an hour it is, regardless of how much volume is available in that half an hour that you pick, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little, based on your ability to trade and the fact that you're trading, that you know that you only get a half an hour to do this, 
and you have the skills to do it, and the fact that you're, you have maximum focus going into it, you will extract the maximum amount, whatever it is, in that half an hour. So it won't make a difference. It just won't. He didn't believe that. He really didn't. He found out that it was true. It did not make a difference. He averaged, while he did this, he averaged $180,000 a day, almost every day, for just a half an hour. Change, wait, change the whole character of the bond pit. The whole character of the bond pit because all these other people in the bond pit who are there grinding it out all day long are watching him stroll in, stay a half an hour, and walk out with a whole boatload of money and are thinking, hey, what am I doing? Now I'll go ahead and ask your question. How do you maintain this position? Meaning it's just one square foot. It really wasn't a problem. Just the right. fact that he was a half an hour. Mm -hmm. They did just, just yeah. He was such stature, because of his stature. They stepped aside. It's a pecking order. Now. Yeah, it's a pecking yeah. order, right? Was he, was he able to keep his profits after a while? Yeah, well, they, it, uh, he he ended up in a in a really one of the bitterest divorce proceedings you could imagine, and and he and his wife actually uh, um, got him and joined from him going into the pit. He couldn't even he couldn't even trade for almost two and a half years. Wow. Oh, because she didn't want him to lose the money. That's right. Well, they spent it all on attorneys anyway, so it didn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a guy. His yeah. wife used to come up at 9.15 in the morning, and they were going through like a, they had problems, and eventually got divorced. Just rag and rag and rag. The guy just nice way to start the day. And it had an effect, you know? How could it not? Yeah, he'd think his wife would, you know, and he'd say, don't call me that. I hang up on people at times. I can't talk, fuck. They go. understand. No. I did that once. Go ahead, John. Do you ever get traders that are trading well that then come to you? No. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you're saying. saying. Yeah. Right. You know, if A is, you know, Wayne Dyer talks about this. Says A is perfect health, and B is where we live, and C is death. Most of us go see a doctor when we're at C to get back to B. Right. Very rarely do we are we at B happy or pleased or satisfied, and take the step to get to A to a higher level. I get two kind of traders. Okay. Or, I don't really do much of this anymore, but I used to get two kinds of traders. The ones who were really successful and just wanted to become more successful, and the ones who were in a state of absolute desperation. Everyone in between, pretty much no. Okay. If someone's trading at the high end of that, how, is there more room? Oh, uh, there's always more room, absolutely. Or are you looking at their behaviors and finding out that he, they're successful in spite of some negatives so if we pull the negatives out? And sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you can't see it as a trader until someone observes the pattern. It's them. difficult unless you've acquired the kind of skills that, you know, would take a long time to acquire. It's a lot easier for someone else to, you know, to spot it. It's difficult to do even with the skills when you when you, the kind of self analysis that you're talking about. It, it's still it can it can be difficult, you know, to do on your own. <coughs> Some of the beliefs that we have are so so entrenched and create such uh, um, create these kind of closed loops that are that are really difficult to see into on our own because our lives are in, in a pattern that is so self-evident that it is, it's almost inconceivable that we could even question the pattern because it's been a pattern that it's, it's, that's existed all our lives. So therefore, it is a fabric of reality instead of just something that I learned and I'm perpetuating it over and over and over again. Uh, is, is the guy on the tape, does he have a real rough voice? It dog. sounds like him. Is it, it, it Bob like Monroe? It sounded like an old guy. Okay. Yeah, and, then he, like an old and at the end of the tape, wake up! Does he, does he do that? No. no. Oh, he doesn't? No. He doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be kind of panicked. <laughs> <laughs> You're all mellow. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be very nice. Get up, Fletch! <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, the tapes that I used to listen to, that's what I did. I'm glad you didn't Wake up! <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> uh, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, really. It seemed like it anyway. I mean, you know, you're in this kind of kind of deep, real quiet space, and, exactly. you know. <laughs> Um. So how do you, if you want to buy one of those other tapes? Well, I gave you the catalog. No, there's oh, no yeah. price list, there's no place. Oh, there isn't? Oh, just call them up. You can, look, we're distributors, you can call us. We don't really, I mean, that's not something we do. I, I mean, we'll order them for you, but you can order them direct. Okay. Right from the room. Wondered, you know. Yeah, no, it's no problem. I thought there was, I thought there were, the catalog included price lists. I'm not, the, oh, the tapes aren't very expensive. Right. I don't. I don't really remember how remember how much they are, but I think they're like, I don't know, maybe twenty or twenty five dollars or something, or I don't know. Hmm. Just there's prices for those. Yeah. And that's not the only. I mean, they have a, they have a, a number of of different types of tapes doing to do a number of different things. Some would be considered pretty bizarre, but um, uh, and I've been down there. Uh, as part of their professional group a couple of times and uh, for a whole week with other people in other other industries mostly I, I would say uh, people in the psychiatric psychiatric industry that use their products and they get together and talk about you know how the products can improve and and uh, you know other uses for them and just you know sharing a lot of ideas it was mostly like a summer camp for adults basically is what it really amounted to it was really a lot of fun uh, well, let's kind of review from yesterday. We went through a lot of material yesterday. And uh, we're going to go through a lot again today. Anybody got any comments or ideas about some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday? And everybody's really just... Uh, <laughs> Just at peace with all this and ready to go, huh? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I think if you, you know, the way I always think outside the box, you know, I came here with different agendas other than trading. That's what I challenge myself with every day, trying to think outside the box, how to look in the mirror and become better. And if you take the time to do that, and you have the courage to actually look in the mirror and look deep, I mean, some of that stuff yesterday was life-changing. And you're just not going to get that. I mean, you just... To get access to that information with yourself, just if you're open to it, they can take a wound and heal it immediately. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, what we're going to get into in just a little bit uh, what what I call like a practical philosophy for change, and um, just a real practical way of looking at why why consciously altering ourselves and changing ourselves and adapting ourselves can be so rewarding, because I think it's really one of the keys to happiness. But it does, you know, the, the, the fundamental component is what John just said, a willingness to think, a willingness to think, what he, as he referred to, was outside the box, but basically just a willingness to think. Because nothing constricts what we can think about, nothing. Only one thing. Let's put it this way. Nothing can limit what we can think about except for one thing. And what is that? Beliefs. What? Beliefs. Nope. Nope. Fear. Fear, which would mean a, which, we, which would mean what? What, what are the implications of last, lack of fear? Or, or li what are the implications of, of, of a fear of thinking in a certain direction? Because you limit yourself to things. You're not open to all the data that's available to you. Okay. Well, I was just thinking like just, just, just a lack of willingness. That's the only thing. No desire. <clears throat> Lack of desire. Yeah. Because that what, that's what it really what it takes. That's what, what all of this takes. It all boils down to, what do you want? <clears throat> what are you willing to focus your energy on with conviction? Because regardless of what technique you're comfortable with. If you choose to go through a process of transformation, it really doesn't matter what technique you use. 
I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. I mean, it can matter if you're, if you're using it inappropriately and you don't know what you're doing. But, but technique is not as critical as desire. So there's really only one thing that stops anybody from thinking outside of what they've learned to believe. And that's a lack of willingness. Correspondingly, all it takes to tap into creative or inspirational, inspirational information is a willingness, desire. If the desire is genuine, you'll get the information. That's, that's an absolute fact, it really is. And I know maybe for some people who, who you know, might not have experienced this or experienced it on a regular basis, that's all it really takes, is a genuine, sincere desire. And if you try it and you don't get the information or don't get any information, then I would say that your desire was not genuine and sincere. It's what would commonly be referred to as lip service. <laughs> You're saying the right words, but you know the sincere energy isn't behind the words. And that's really what it takes. Along that same line, though, if you've never had change in your life where you can see an A, B situation, mm -hmm. to actually put yourself to think that it could change is a huge gap. It, it really is, yes. But once you find someone that actually gets that A, B and can say, I was a different person the other day, I had a different thought process yesterday, if that accelerates, you're going to have a, a, just a dynamic curve straight up. Oh, yeah. It's, like it's just that first huge step that makes all the other steps far along the way. Right. Yeah, good point, John. I would say those those kind of changes, those kind of those kind of first step changes for me came in years. Years. Yeah. But you know that was a long time ago, and, and didn't have access to the kind of the kind of uh, insight and material that's available today too. Or let's say it was available, but not readily accessible like today. Put it that way. Things have changed a lot in the last twenty and thirty years. They really have. I mean, when I was writing the Discipline Trader back in, you know, starting in 1982, and 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 you know, in, in dissecting the dynamics of beliefs and belief systems and things like that, I mean, at the time I thought I was really way out there and 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 really afraid to even share the material with people because I thought they'd think I was crazy. Really, I'm serious, especially the trading community. I, I see that all the time. Not all the time, it's much, but there's a certain degree of people I've come across over the years as traders who kind of. Think that this aspect of learning about yourself and uh, <clears throat> thinking that that's going to help you as a trader is a little bit uh, unmanly. I think is the way that most people think. Oh, about sure, it. and that. not as much now as what it used to no, be. Right. I mean, but you know, but but certainly back in you know when I was working pr predominantly with floor traders in Chicago, back in the sure. '80s. I mean, you know, I would say I would say the vast majority of floor traders looked at Mark Douglas like, whoa, whoa, you know, get away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've spoken at conferences. There was the first conference I actually spoke at. Uh, Tim Slater invited me to speak at, at CompuTrack in uh, was it 1980, April in 1983 or 1984. I don't remember. And uh, down in New Orleans, and um, it was kind of amazing how uh, how the chain of events occurred to even me get, getting that invitation in the first place because it was just. It was, just, it was just really bizarre circumstances uh, or synchronicities that, that were really like, that were kind of mind-boggling to me. But anyway, I was invited to go down there to speak. And um, uh, one of the, and, and, and uh, and at the time, I mean, I, you know, I had, I had no credentials at all. I had nothing. I really did. I had absolutely no credentials to be doing what I was doing. And but Tim and, I, and it was all really just based on a, on a conversation that Tim and I had at dinner. And I just happened to sit down next to him because some woman broke a date with me, 
and uh, or I wouldn't have even been at that particular banquet. And you know, she, she broke this date I was waiting for her, and I happened to sit down next to Tim Slater, didn't even know who he was. And we talked, and then I found out later on that you know, he, did these, um, uh, he did these conferences and uh, thought, well, since I was working on the psychology of trading and he had technical analysis, let's put the two together and do a workshop or something. Well, when I called him up, and he said, well, yeah, I'm doing a conference. And he, and he, you know, and he said, well, I'll think about you know, maybe adding you to the, um, adding you to the uh, schedule. I'm um, thinking, oh, man. You know. So he called me back like two or three days later, and he said, okay, you're on. And, and from that moment on, this was like January, and, and, the, and the conference was in April. And from that moment on, I mean, I just, I just obsessed over this presentation. I mean, totally and completely. I scrutinized it. Might, sometimes it might have taken me a week to get a sentence. I mean, literally. I'd, 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 I'd go over, you know, just over and over and over again. So when I got down there, I mean, it, was, it would be uh, a, a, a huge... Um, understatement to say I, I was really, really nervous. Uh, there were 850 people at that conference. And there were probably, I don't know, maybe 18 or 19 speakers or something like that. And of course all the other speakers, they'd written books and, and all that kind of stuff and, and had reputations. And so Tim had a, a general meeting uh, for everyone uh, the, the first day of the conference in the morning. It was like I think around you know, 9 o'clock in the morning or something like that before everyone started. And one of the first surprising things that I found that when I got down there is that Tim had me speaking like he's either six or seven times in a three-day period and all the other speakers were only speaking like twice. I'm thinking well, there's got to be a mistake here and I'm, you know, I didn't want to say anything to Tim and I'm thinking there were some things that just weren't adding up. One, the number of times he had me speaking. Two, the material that I that I had submitted for the you know the big book that, that you get when you go to these conferences wasn't in the book, and it wasn't much material. But you know I didn't really have any material. But 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 it, it wasn't in the book anyway, and it was just in the packet. In other words, you get these one of these huge satchels and the books in there, and my stuff is separate. So you know, I'm sitting in the middle of the audience listening to Tim talk about you know you know we, some of the restaurants to go to in New Orleans. In fact, in fact, I think it was even was it Monte Gras? No, it wasn't Monte Gras. Anyway, what to do in New Orleans and what to watch out for and, and be careful of this or whatever. And then he, uh, he said, you know, and then he did this, this disclaimer thing about, you know, whatever, what, what the speakers say, you know, CompuTrack uh, has no legal liability and all this kind of good stuff. And then he said, but I want you to pay particular attention. Now I'm sitting there, I'm just sitting in this chair, right? <laughs> so I want you to pay particular attention to... Um, this material that we didn't put in the book specifically because we want you to pay particular attention to Mark Douglas. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, my, <laughs> <I was> like <laughs> my heart almost exploded. It really did. I was like, what the hell is going on? Is it, and, and I mean, I didn't even hear the rest of what he said because it just, it just freaked me out. So uh, I had to speak uh, not really too much longer after that, maybe two or three hours after that. And... Um, and I'm thinking this whole time that I'm, that I'm down there, or you know, before all this, that, okay, you know, nobody knows who I am. I, it's like psychology of trading, not something that people are even paying much attention to. You know, how many people might end up in one of my, in one of my sessions, right? You know, five or 10 people. Okay, I can make an ass out of myself in front of five or 10 people. It's all right, okay, I, I can do that. And so, uh, I'm standing in front of this door where this, you know, where the sign says Mark Douglas Psychology of Trading, and I'm talking to another one of the speakers. I don't remember his name, and and he was just, you know, he was being real nice, and and, and, and when I say that 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 sweat was literally dripping off my hands, I am not exaggerating. It was dripping off my hands, and um, I'm even getting nervous even talking about it. I mean, it's just, you know, just but the memory of going back into that experience is putting me back into that experience in that state of mind. So uh, uh, we're talking, and I'm watching people kind of stream into this room, and I'm, and I'm getting upset. I mean, I'm literally I'm watching people walk into this room. I'm standing, you know, maybe 10 or 15 feet away from the door, and I'm thinking, why are they doing this to me? What, why? No, I'm, why are they doing this to me? You know, and it's a, I don't understand it. You know, and, and I'm, you know, I kind of glance in the room, there's like maybe 70 or 80 people in there. And I'm really pissed. I'm thinking, come on. <laughs> I wouldn't go listen to me talk. Why are they going to listen to me talk? <laughs> you 
and so the other the other speaker left because he had to um, uh, he had to he had a session himself. So I was standing there by myself, and it was a real defining moment in my life because I was uh, I was more than seriously considering bolting. I, no, I was I was going to bolt. I really was. I was I was standing there thinking to myself. I knew this would be it. I knew that Tim would never ever invite me back to another conference. I mean, that, that, that's what I was contemplating at that point, whether I could accept the, the deep sense of regret that I would experience by, by bolting and what I was gonna say to Tim. And I was running it through my mind and just like, you know, just like checking the probability out. And like I said, it was, it was, it was I, I don't know if 50-50, 60-40, whatever in terms of 60 in terms of bolting. But just at, at this right moment, I mean, like I said, this defining moment as to whether or not I was literally going to run, this person came up to me and someone was going to walk into the room. He walked over to me. He saw the name tag and he says, oh, he said, you're Mark Douglas, right? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, shouldn't we get going? <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> 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 and uh, I walked into the room and it was really weird. Because it was because once I walked into the room and because there was they, they didn't have anybody introducing you or anything else like that it was just you just did it on your own. Once I walked into the room and, and got in front of everybody, I was fine. And not only that, I, I didn't even use my presentation. I just spoke spontaneously off the top of my head. And I had to because that first presentation was a little bit shorter than the two-hour presentation that I prepared for. Well, anyway, I did a really good job and did such a good job that the next time that I spoke, there were like even more people in the room. And then by Saturday, after, this is on Friday, by Saturday afternoon, I, I literally almost had the whole conference in the room. They were lined up around the walls and out the door. And I mean, it's just, and there were the same people that were coming to these presentations over and over and over again. And I, I was just like, I was really astounded, absolutely astounded. Until Sunday, Sunday morning, I was in an elevator with somebody, and I, then I figured out what was going on. Like, what was this phenomenon? And some guy, you know, he looked at me and said, oh, you're Mark Douglas. You're the guy that's making us all feel good. Now, that was not my intent for my presentation. But, I mean, that's not, that wasn't the goal of my presentation. But as it turned out, I was giving people information about the nature of trading that they never, ever heard before meaning that there isn't anything wrong with you. Because back in the early 80s, especially futures traders, everyone lied about their results. Everyone was losing, literally everyone was losing, and everyone was saying that they were winning. And so all the people that were saying to their friends, oh yeah, I'm doing great, but they were losing their ass, and their friends were saying, oh yeah, I'm doing great too, they all thought it was just them that was lying. They didn't know that everyone else was lying too. And so, and, and, and because I had worked at Merrill Lynch and I, and I saw how virtually everyone, and I worked at one of Merrill Lynch's biggest offices in Chicago, I had access to, their, to the account, to the, to the uh, uh, printouts and of their customer base where, where I could say that 99% of all their customers were losing money. And I, and I said that in the conference. I mean, I, I just said that to everybody. It's like, it's like I just lifted this huge, weight off their shoulders to think, okay, there's nothing wrong with me and there are specific reasons why I'm losing. And so as a result, everyone wanted to hear this presentation over and over and over again. Now the next year when I went back and uh, Tim invited me back to speak, I thought, okay, this is really good. What I'll do is I'll really give them the meat. Okay, I'll, I'll you know, instead of, you know, because th that first one, I didn't really get into a lot of depth. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll really put together a presentation and, and give them some real substance. I would say the first presentation that I did, I had probably 300 people in the room and I lost 200 of them in the first 20 minutes. And it's been like that ever since. <laughs> 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 so Dave when you're talking about people you know it, like and I have found it really the, the industry you know the, the industry is evolving you know back in the early 80s this message just was, was not very well received at all 
especially if there's any depth to it. But, uh, you know, things are changing a lot. They really are. There was, which reminds me of a, the very first time I ever did a two-day workshop. It was sometime in the um, late 80s, not the late 80s, maybe 1986 or 1987. I, I, I was doing one-day workshops, but I never expanded it to a two-day. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll, I'll expand it to two days. And I had probably 11 or 12 guys in the room, and they were mostly all floor traders. Actually, mostly all from the S&P pit in, in, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And so it just so happened it was in October in the weekend where you have to turn your clocks back. And... Uh, and, I, and I'd forgotten all about that because, you know, I was preoccupied with the workshop. And so I got there, you know, I got to the workshop about a half an hour early. And, of course, nobody's there. And I think it was supposed to start at 8 or 9 o'clock. And at the time it was supposed to start, nobody's there. It's just like, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I really did it this time. <laughs> nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. <laughs> Until somebody finally showed up and I figured out that I didn't do my clock. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, the thing is, and, and what this really, what this all really gets down to, is something that we, you know, we talked about Friday night and yesterday. Is that you still don't need to have any of this to put on a winning trade. That's the whole point. None of this is necessary to put on a winning trade. None of this is necessary to put on two winning trades or three winning, three winning trades. But eventually, what we all find out is that we can put on winning trades. But there's a huge difference between being able to, or let's say, you know, getting a, getting a few winning trades here and there, or even, even on a consistent, you know, a fairly consistent basis. There, there's a huge difference between that and, of course, and, and what your bottom line results are when you experience huge drawdowns or, or a series of drawdowns as a result of mental errors. And when you become dissatisfied with that, start looking for something to remedy the situation. And that's what takes a lot of work. Because, like we've been saying all along, it has everything to do with the way you think and, and in essence, the way you live your life. Uh, just so I'm clear on kind of where we're probably going to be going today, I think the essence of what we were trying to bring out up until this point was getting comfortable with the whole notion that it's your belief structure that may be limiting you in whatever aspect of your life, or perhaps more specifically your trading. I'm under the impression that what we're going to try to do today is that we're going to try to not only identify those beliefs, but also work on patterns or work on techniques to uh, neutralize them or redirect the energy, however you want exactly. to Exactly, right. Yeah. That's exactly what we're going to do. Remember that we have. Remember that that the kind of problems that we face as traders are going to fall into <coughs> fall into pretty much two basic categories, in terms of in terms of what's going on inside of us. We have we have we have a like genetically encoded uh, ways of thinking, meaning our minds are wired to think in certain ways that cause us to believe that what is what we're experiencing in this now moment is identical to something that's already in our minds as a memory. That's a problem. Because, because we know the, what's the reality of the situation. What's, what's true? What's really true? Every moment is unique. And see, because of our mind's inherent you know, propensity to associate, it's that mechanism that we have to compensate for. So we have to do something specific to compensate for that mechanism. That's, that's one of the things we need to do. Because the reality is every moment is truly unique. That is, that is the truth. Our minds make it seem as if this moment can be identical to something I've already experienced. Sometimes there'll be a correspondence, okay? There will be a course, enough of a correspondence that we'll experience some degree of satisfaction based on what decision we make because our minds associated this now moment, this unique moment with some memory that we have. But as traders, we, there, there's too much of a capability, I mean, there, there's too much of a potential, let's say, to, uh, to make <laughs> catastrophic errors by allowing this mechanism to cause us to think that we know what's going to happen next. See, so what we want to do is, is take that gap away between 
the reality of each moment being unique and what our memories say and say, you know what, I need to install a mechanism in my mind that will not let me think that this moment is anything other than unique. That's what we're doing. I need to install a mechanism in my mind that will not allow me to believe or think that this moment is anything other than unique. That way my mind is now open to receive anything that may be of relevance in terms of what could satisfy my desires or goals. So that I can make a decision based on all the information that's available, not just what might satisfy my expectations. And remember, my expectations are going to be what? Based on what? What are my expectations always based on? Well, beliefs. Yeah, what, because an expectation is a belief projected out into some future moment. So that's exactly what we don't want as traders. We do not want to be basing our decisions on our expectations because our ex because when our expectations are fulfilled, we feel satisfied and happy. And that's something that we all desire. And when our expectations go unfulfilled, we experience emotional pain. This is a, a, a universal characteristic of humans. Probably of anything that's alive and can think. I mean, we've got cats and when they don't get to go out, they're, they're in emotional pain. <laughs> so what we don't want is we don't want to be uh, perceiving information based on this limited kind of, uh, this limited filter so that only the information that makes me happy gets filtered into my mind or gets allowed in and all the information that has the potential to make me feel anything other than happy gets, you know, gets filtered out in some, in some way, either completely ignored or altered or distorted in some way. So we need that mechanism. So this is what I was saying before. What I was saying before is that we're, we're going to use our trading. We're going to use the actual, let's say, process of trading to create these mental mechanisms that will cause us to think that, no, this moment is really unique. And that doesn't mean you can't feel or sense or know what's going to happen next, because you can. But it'll be from a different context. It won't be from a rationally based context. It'll be from an intuitively based context. These are worlds apart. Because if it's genuine intuition, it seems like as if I'm going to maybe contradict many of the things that I've said earlier. But if it's genuine intuition, you'll always be right. Because in essence, you're in the zone. That is, that you've tapped, you spontaneously tapped into that that framework where you are in complete harmony, let's say, with the market consciousness, that, that collective consciousness of everyone who's participating, and you are in the zone. So it's not a rationally based knowing, it's an intuitive based knowing. But it's our rational mind that'll always, one, keep us from getting into it, because if I think I know what's happened, if I think I know or believe what's happening at a rational level, it means that my knowing is coming only from my past. Are you guys with me on this? The knowing is coming only from my past. My past cannot... What's that? Well, you can predict the future. You can, yeah, anybody can guess the future. And, you know, or, you know, that's not, I'm not saying you can't predict the future, but let's put it this way. My past based on what's already in my mind, can't know a truly unique moment because a truly unique moment is something that never existed. My past can only know it afterwards, or my rational mind can only know it after the fact. So how do you reconcile that with your intuition? Because your intuition is saying go, 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 go. 
Your intuition won't say, go, 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 go. Intuition doesn't work like that. Intuition isn't compelling in any way. Your rational mind is compelling. If you feel compelled to do anything, it's, it's coming from your rational mind. Your intuition is just spontaneous. You just find yourself doing things. Your rational mind is the one that's going to pull you out of doing it. So how do you it's, like, it's like it's doing something without, any, without weighing and judging. You see, your rational mind weighs and judges everything based on your past. When you're in, when you're in that kind of a zone and acting spontaneous, spontaneously and intuitively, you won't be weighing or judging anything. In essence, you'll just be finding yourself doing something. It's like your rational mind will wake up and say, hey, what am I doing? It's kind of abstract. Can you just show me? Can you show me a trade that's rationally based versus? It, I mean, just. You know, it like would. Uh, John, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't make any difference. Okay. You see, in terms of showing you a trade, I mean, I could pull up a whole oh, bunch of charts. I'm just thinking. Of, tell me a trade that's rationally based. You know, versus. I mean, an example. Any trade. Any trade that you that you think. Any trade that's based on a pattern that you know at a rational level, is would be a rationally based trade. Meaning anything you've already learned about. And it's in your mind as a memory. Whereas something, have you ever had, John, have you ever had kind of a gut feeling about something, but didn't, you know, didn't really have a way to, to judge it from a rational perspective? That's what I'm talking about. You know, it's, uh, I'll give you an example. There's, I don't even know if I have that chart with me. But there was a, there was a chart I was, I was doing, um, a typical pattern I'm going to show you guys later an ABCD pattern where AB equals CD, it'd be something like, um, this would be like a 618 retracement and like this. And these two lines right here, these two waves are exactly equal. And one of the reasons why I use Q charts is because I can very, I can click on this line. When I get this wave, when I get this low and this high, and this retracement right here, and I get an isolated low right here where it looks like it might start doing this, what I do is I clone this line, I click on this line, I clone it, and I can actually move it here, put it on this low, and see how the market reacts coming up to point D, okay? Well, I don't remember exactly when it was, but there was a, uh, uh, there was a, what I thought was a perfect ABCD setting up in the Dow, it was last year sometime, and, uh, uh, and it was on a 60 minute chart, and you know, of course, the bigger, the higher the time frame the chart, the more significant the move. So I put on my chart, I put on my chart, buy D. I'm supposed to sell D. Didn't even realize, buy D, okay? That would be, okay, buy D, okay? So when the market, I, I, was, I actually didn't trade the day that, that this, this happened, but the market, the market came up to D and literally just, I mean, blew right through it. I mean, you know, it was like a 150, 200 point move. So that would be something, you know, it's like, see, I don't look at that as being an accident that I made, that I, that I put, that I made that kind of an error on the chart by saying buy D instead of sell D. You know, that has happened to me, and then I spend the next week trying to quantify it. <laughs> how did I do that? And I can't, I can't put, I don't know how it happened. So I'm in that trading hell. Right. <laughs> You know, we're talking about you know trading intuitively, and and, it, and it's really intriguing. But uh, keep something in mind that you know Sean just said is that is that one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is that even when we get to the point in the in the in the workbook where we talk about it, we're, we're talking about it now. But but um, <coughs> if you haven't if you let's say if you haven't trained your rational mind to trust intuitively based information, the best thing to do is just notice it and not trade intuitively, not act on it. Just notice it and write it down and pay attention to it that every time it happens, you can start building a backlog or repertoire in, of rationally based information saying, I can trust this. And there's a reason why I say that is because there is, you can manufacture, you can get, you can get so excited about the idea that you can you know, and it have this sense of knowing of what's going to happen, that um, you can, at a rational level, manufacture a feeling that, that, that's very similar to that kind of intuitive sense. And, and the problem is that uh, that manufactured feeling isn't intuition, 
and you will virtually always be wrong when you're operating out of that sense of, let's say I call it like a hope, like a hope that feels like intuition and genuine intuition. What you have to do, what you really have to do is get yourself to the point where you virtually have no potential to hope whatsoever. Like why would you have to hope for anything? Once you really trust yourself, you don't have to hope for anything. So if you still have the potential to hope that the market does something for you, and that's in essence what you're saying. I'm hoping that the market does this. I'm hoping that the market does this for me. And the only reason why you could hope that the market does anything for you is because you don't feel like you have the resources to trust yourself to do it for yourself. Otherwise, hope wouldn't exist. So as long as you have that potential to, to manufacture that sense of hope that feels very much like intuition, where you won't, you'll find it very difficult to make the distinction between the two, the best thing to do is just not trade intuitively. In other words, don't act on it right away. Let, it, let yourself work up a, you know, a nice repertoire so that you can start trusting yourself. Trusting it, put it that way. And that might take a long time. Took the example of buying full backs, mm -hmm. right? You get a narrow range day or something, and you're looking to buy over the top of that. <coughs> and you say, okay, the rational idea is it's pulled back. We found another level of buyers at this price, and so I'm buying over that resistance prior day. That would be a rational thought, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. The intuitive side would be it's pulled back three days. I'm going to go bid here because my gut is, or I intuitively think, most pullbacks last three to four days, and I'm hoping. I get the bottom. And I would say that's not intuition. Right. Based on the way I define intuition, that's just that's just another rationally based. That's that manufactured. Yeah, that could be man yeah, manufactured rationally based uh, well, if you're thinking, thought process. That's like see, you're, see, you're thinking about it, you're not you're not in it anyway. Right. See the whole the whole point is that you're really not thinking. You're not weighing or judging anything. You're finding yourself doing something. It's like, you know, it's like <laughs> looking at a chart. You know, I'm looking at a chart and, and I might have asked myself, you know, two or three minutes before, you know, oh, where's the next best edge? And and all of a sudden I get distracted. And I'm not really, even, I'm not thinking about where that next best edge is. And then all of a sudden, my attention is drawn to a line that I would normally have not paid attention to because it, it's not part of my repertoire of what the market does. But see, intuitively based information is creative. Creative, think about the definition, bringing forth something that didn't previously exist. I wouldn't have paid attention to that particular line or that particular level. And all of a sudden, I've got my attention drawn to it, and I think, Oh, okay, well, you know, let's, let's put an order here. No weighing, no judging, really no thinking. If you're weighing, judging, and thinking, it's not intuition. It's something that's spontaneous. It's just like when, I would, when, when I'm you know, writing the discipline trader and trading in the zone. And a technique that I'm going to give you in a few minutes. I'd ask myself a question. Now, if, if, think about this. If I ask myself a question, if I thought I really had the answer, I wouldn't have asked the question in the first place. Meaning that I really believe I don't have the answer. I'm not trying to figure out the answer. I'm not doing any analysis, you know, like, like going through all my memories and, and trying to work something out, trying to figure out a problem. I'm not doing that. I don't have the answer. And then I forget about the question. Or in that moment. I mean, just you, know, you get distracted, you start doing other things. Then all of a sudden, it's like, boom. The information just gets dumped into my brain, or I find myself speaking it without knowing it. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I didn't think about the information that's in my brain. It was, it's now there, and I've got to write it down. And I find that if I don't write it down, it evaporates, and I can't, re I can't reconstruct it. I can't tell you, you know, how many times. It hadn't ha didn't happen that many times because it was just too painful. But the number, it didn't, the number of times it did happen where, where I didn't either write it down right away or I put it in my computer didn't save it right away, and something happened to my computer and I lost it, that, that was like, and then try to reconstruct it at a rational level, I couldn't do it. 
I couldn't do it because it wasn't in my brain at a rational level. It wasn't part of my memories. It didn't have anything to stick to because there wasn't really a framework, because it was, because it was new information, new for me. So I'm not, I'm not weighing, I'm not judging, I'm just asking a genuine question because I don't have an answer and, and I desire the answer. And if the, and if the desire is genuine, you will get an answer that corresponds with your question. No, I didn't say that at all, Jeff. Okay. No, not at all. Just make sure. I'm not saying any of this is good or any of this is bad. Just, it's just, it's just all a function of what, it, just what, what you desire, where, where you want to go, what, what you want for yourself in your life. Maybe because the, the ABCD that you were talking about is a rationally based trade. Yeah. Well, okay. I, Jeff, I trade rationally. Okay. okay. I'm not. Give, I'm not. Uh, you know. Okay. Don't get the impression that this is what I do here. Okay. okay. I, not every trade is intuitive. Okay. I, you know, it's. I'm just giving you examples of, of, of times that it was, okay? Ask some questions. And also, I don't, I'm not at a level in my life where I completely and absolutely trust it either, as a trader. I'm still working on it. The example you gave, that, that was really an error in, in your technique. No. No, I no, I didn't. First of all, I didn't put an order in the market. Number one. All I'm saying is that on the, I put, I write on the chart what I'm going to do, and I, what I wrote on the chart was I, what I should have written, was sell D, and I didn't even notice until the next day where I actually wrote buy D. Okay. That's not a good thing. That's oh yeah, no, that to me, yes, absolutely. That's that's not an. See, there are. I don't look at it that way. I don't look at the, those kinds of errors as being errors, or those, I don't look at unconscious mistakes as being uh, as not having significance. I don't look at them as sort of a random thing at all. That was my. That was, let's say, at a subconscious level. You know, come this information that we're gonna we're gonna talk about in a minute about where information can come from. One second, Jay. Let, let me just let me do one thing. about the different levels of, of information. You can say that, you know, that there's the conscious, the subconscious, and I'm looking at the intuitive or spiritual, okay? I would say that that particular, whatever, you know, what caused me to type buy and sell came from down here. And I didn't notice it at a conscious level until the next day. Go ahead, Jake. I was going to say, that if you have an unconscious belief that makes you trade incorrectly, how do you separate that? Like, you know, like, in other words, it's causing you to make a mistake unconsciously, right? Mm -hmm. How do you separate that from it, what you <coughs> describe as intuition? I'm not sure. Okay, say the, ask me the question again. Like, in other words, <coughs> your intuition made you right, sell, uh, buy D. It, yeah, my intuition told me to buy D. Right. Okay. What if, you know, you, there's something in your brain you know, which was a bad belief that caused a trading error that, they just, you know, they just say buy here or whatever. Well, and, what about and it? And it didn't work. Okay, what about it? I, mean, I just say, how do you separate intuition from an unconscious belief? And you're just not aware of it. That's really the question. Well, very easy. I, I, the, the, I shouldn't say very easy. It's just that, I, I, you know, the criteria is if, if it was the perfect thing to do, it was intuition. Anything less than that, and it was rationally based. And I'm not saying that you can't make a decision at a rational level that can't be perfect. All I'm saying is that your intuition will always, based on my definition and the way that I look at it, you can look at it and define it any way that you want. All I'm saying is that in my framework, in my context, intuition will always cause me to step into an experience in a way that's in complete harmony with the environment that I'm, that I'm in in that moment based on what my desire is. is. Would that be a good definition of it? Do you think, does it make sense? It's your basic, basically, it's your goal. What, what, Roman? Basically, it's your goal. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll cause me to step into an experience 
in a way that's in perfect harmony with my desire and the environment that I'm in in that, in that moment. And the environmental forces I'm operating, I'm operating, let's say, in, or the environmental forces that are attendant upon that situation. Anything less than that, in terms of an outcome, would not be intuition. I know this is really kind of hard and abstract stuff, but uh, you know, you guys can listen to the tape over and over again, and and or watch the tape, and and as a result, you know, start doing your own explorations in, in terms of how this works in your life and, and how, you might, how you might use it. And, and let me say something else too, that, that uh, about five or six years ago, I was invited to, to speak at, a, at the first annual intuition conference that was in San Diego. And there were, I don't know, there were, I don't know, about two or 300 people there and, and people from all over the world who investigate the nature of intuition. And you know, one of the things that I came out of that conference with was that nobody could agree on a definition of intuition. <laughs> <laughs> not that there was argument. I'm not saying that, that people were fighting each other. They weren't. I'm just saying that, that all the different definitions were, were mind-boggling, okay? So, uh, you know, I'm just, giving you, I'm just giving you one. I'm not saying there aren't more. You know, do your own investigation and, and, and go on your own path and, and find what's, you know, what works for you. But, uh, and I was amazed, too, at, at all the different ways that intuition worked in people's lives. I, you know, I was just, I was stunned. So, uh, to uh, take a phrase out of, uh, anybody read uh, Conversation with God books by Neil Donald Walsh? The mind is not the only way, it's just another way. So I would, I would say that. And for some of you, just could, it could be a good start. And I'm guilty of, you know, not being uh, consistent with it, but um, what I try to do is always ask, you know, certain questions, how you can do things better, whether it be business, trading, or other parts of your life. And I definitely find that when you stay on that type of a regimen, it definitely makes a, a difference, mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying to go, you know, maybe it's the bottom line, maybe it's a relationship, maybe whatever. Um, what ends up happening, at least for me, is, you know, you start noticing a change, and then you suddenly forget that that regimen was what got you Right. to that point and you kind of stop doing it. Sure. It's so easy to fall off, but you know, if anybody hasn't done that type of stuff, <coughs> here, I mean. To do what? To be asking questions? Just always ask yourself, you, sure. know, you know, areas that you're not satisfied with, or even you are satisfied with and want to make better. It, it, for me at least, it definitely makes a difference. Which I think is the whole con kind of where we are at this point in, right. the, in the conference. Yeah, we are. And what Greg said yesterday too about, you know, about uh, just writing early in the morning. It's, it's, it's a really good technique. Just write anything. You know, what are the techniques I'm going to give you? We can do it right now for, for even identifying a belief. It's, it's the same, it's the exact same technique. Only what I do is put a time constraint on it. In other words, you've got a specific purpose. You know, you could say, um, let's go here, go to page, um, go to page one of section five. One of the first things I say here is when it comes to doing mental work, your attitude is everything. Meaning whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you'll be right. And that's really true. When you're doing mental work, your attitude about it is, is virtually everything. So the more you believe in the possibilities that, that you, know, you can do this kind of work, the more benefit you're going to get from it. So if you want to find out, if you want to find out what's in here, okay? First of all, this is, uh, this is at the conscious level. These are the things that we have conscious access to. There may be, there may be, you may have conscious things, conscious beliefs that you have that are in conflict with your desire to accumulate money as a trader. There may be some subconscious, okay? Remember I said yesterday that I think this line between conscious and subconscious is really artificial? 
in some ways even taught taught because you know when when we're children and there are things going on in our mind that our parents can't explain not only can they not explain it in us they can't explain it in themselves they're gonna say you know just well just forget about that you know just kind of put it just kind of put it in the back of your mind and just you know just forget about it and what ends up happening is that the things that, that we can't explain and we can't deal with they do and the things just automatically in many cases will drop down to a subconscious level of operation anyway okay but it's like you, you it's like you don't I'll put it this way the more you do this kind of work and ask questions the more this line between conscious and subconscious starts to get perforated and and weaker and weaker until there really isn't any definition at all I mean there isn't any declination between the two at all you can have access to anything that's in your mind not only here here but also here and it's just a matter of the kind of work that you do and and that work is is in essence asking yourself questions so for an example I just gave you one example here you want to find out what's going on say to, say to yourself why can't I why can't I accumulate vast sums of money now if I knew the answer to that at a rational level I wouldn't have to be asking the question in the first place now keep in mind and I'm going to keep repeating this because I, I don't I don't know if I, I have the if I have the right words to really convey how important it is that this question be genuine and sincere because any lack of sincerity and you won't get an answer it's like the forces that that exist in you in the universe let's say or exist at these deeper levels you you can't it's like you can't fool God if you really don't want an answer regardless of how much you might say to yourself yes I do yes I do yes I do if the, the asking the question isn't genuine and sincere then you won't get an answer in other words you have to be completely honest with yourself and you will get an answer that corresponds with your level of honesty so if you're asking a question that you that you sense you're afraid to get an answer about then you know ask another question that you might not be so afraid about getting an answer but that you that you can say sincerely and genuinely that I, I really do want an answer I really want to know then write that question at the top of a piece of paper and then give yourself about 20 minutes and what are you gonna do for that 20 minutes you're going to write well, what well what are you gonna write I, you already said I, if, I, if I knew the answer I wouldn't have to ask it in the first place so what are you gonna write what do you think you're gonna write Sad. just whatever <laughs> come write whatever thought comes to your mind uncensored write your stream of consciousness thoughts whatever comes to your mind uncensored don't censor anything don't judge anything don't stop and contemplate it don't think about it if the word or the thought or the feeling comes into your consciousness write it down And after 20 minutes, you can go back and reread what you've written. In other words, hopefully, once you get used to the idea of writing uncensored, you're going to find that you lose this kind of con conscious thought process of judging what you're writing. In other words, you, you won't be judging it. You're just you're going to be so busy trying to write your stream of thoughts that you're not thinking about what you're writing. And then when you go back and reread it, what are you going to be reading? You're going to be re you're going to be discovering yourself. You're going to be reading something that came from your mind onto that piece of paper, and you should have 
you know, what'll, what'll hopefully end up happening is that you'll read something that corresponds to the question that you wrote. You'll have at least a, an answer or part of an answer, and there should be enough there for you to ask another question or to stimulate another question and then put that question at the top of a piece of paper. And keep on doing it until you get to the source of, of the original question of why can't I accumulate vast sums of money? Because it may be, I mean, that's a, that's a big one, by the way. I mean, you can do, you can do smaller ones, but you know, th th you know, working on one like that could take quite a long time. Yeah, more than 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's like songwriting. It's the same thing. Yeah. That's how I wrote Dolly Rock Road. It wrote itself in 20 minutes. Okay, Jake, say that so people can hear it, okay? It's like, you're, you're no, I'm saying this, is, this whole thing is like songwriting, basically. Mm -hmm. Like, I love rock and roll as an example of the biggest song I ever wrote. It was like a complete inspiration. It wrote itself. I was taking dictation. It wrote itself in 20 minutes. It's like automatic. <laughs> No idea where it came from. Actually, I do have an idea. I was listening to the Rolling Stones. It's only rock and roll. I like it, and I had like a knee-jerk reaction to it. I said, "What do you mean it's only rock and roll? I love rock and roll." Whoops. <laughs> 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 Twenty minutes. Wow. Cool. Done. And, um, and, and you're and still getting. How long ago did you write that song? Over twenty years ago. And you're still getting years. a pretty substantial income from it. Aren't well, you? Britney Spears has covered it, so. <laughs> Next year would be a good year. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. And if you're posing a very deep question like this one, and you can't, <coughs> you can't. I mean, as as we're as we're talking about it, I'm I'm, I'm trying to think of. You know, we have A, B, C, D, E here. I'm I'm trying to think of what things could be inside me. Uh, and, those are just examples, by the way. Right. Okay. I'm I, just. But when, when, when we've been talking about asking questions and sometimes while, while, while you're talking, I'm thinking of things right. and, and asking questions and not coming up with even like the first thing. So you're just a, a technique to try to uncover that would Wait, just Stop, be one second. I would, then I would ask, then I would ask, well, what's stopping me from getting an answer? You're not, you said you're not coming up with the first thing, right? Then I would do the technique based on, well, what's stopping you from coming up with an answer? And then do that exercise for 20 minutes and write down every thought that comes to your mind. Break it down, break it down to, you know, to, to like the, the most fundamental or basic components. I mean, just break your questions down as, as you know, as far as you can. In fact, kind of a rule of thumb, I'll give you a rule of thumb that I use when I, when, you know, in my consulting work and my coaching, is that one, when people, uh, when, when people call up, we identify, I help them identify the challenge that's going to be in relationship to whatever they desire or their goal, create a process, in other words, how are we going to get there? And then break the process down to its smallest incremental steps. And then just take one step at a time. <coughs> and so that, that particular formula you can use for any particular trading skill that you want to learn. Any trading skill at all. If you put it within the context of that formula, if you can think to yourself, you know, I'd like to be able to trade breakouts. I'm not a good breakout trader. That's something I haven't spent any time really, you know, any, any time teaching myself how to do. So at the time when I'm ready to, you know, to get to the point where I want to, you know, acquire this skill of being an excellent breakout trader, I will create, that's my challenge, I'll create a process, I'll break the process down to the smallest incremental steps and take one step at a time. Uh, I, I, another example of that would be a trader that comes to mind that, that I worked with many years ago. He uh, owned some construction companies uh, 
down south. He was a guy in his uh, late 50s at the time. Uh, you can imagine the kind of guys that would own construction companies, let's say in Dallas, okay? And uh, he, he, and, uh, he'd been trading, <laughs> he'd been trading uh, bond futures and just getting, just getting, just getting wiped out. So he thought, you know what, he's going to come up to Chicago and show these bond traders something. <laughs> and bought a seat at the Chicago Board of Trade. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Anyway, he bought a seat at the Chicago Board of Trade and uh, went into the pit to trade and found out that it was just a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more violent and athletic than, than what he was, than what he could have imagined. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, another, way situa another one of these situations where someone told him to call me, and uh, um, so he did, and, and we spent probably, I don't know, maybe a week or so, a week or a week and a half, where, where one, one of the problems he had is he, he really didn't even know how to define support resistance, and I was, and I was using point and figure charts at the time. Which I think are really good, by the way, but there isn't really much software where you can, I don't know of any software that really does two-point figure charting anymore. But um, uh, uh, anyway, so what I did is I helped him, uh, I helped him be able to identify support and resistance within a uh, eight to 10 tick range, okay, in the bonds. So uh, when, when we got to the point where he, were, you know, he was comfortable and, and we thought he could do this, uh, uh, the, for the next day, we, you know, we had support, we had resistance here, support here, and, and here, you know, here was the deal, okay, this guy's a multi-millionaire. Here's the deal. This was the task, and we broke the process down, smallest incremental steps, right? The task was, fortunately, the task was for him to buy one bond contract, one bond contract at support, and hold on to it until it if it came to support first, and hold on to it, if it came up to resistance, sell it out for the profit, and then you know sell to, and that was it. Okay, he was supposed to risk uh, three ticks, one hundred dollars. Okay, that's all he was. Now that that was that was the task. He just had to go in, and unfortunately for us, in this particular exercise, the market you know opened up somewhere in the middle right here. And uh, so when the market came down, was coming down to, I don't know what this price was, let's just say it was 09. The market's coming down to 09. Uh, he starts getting panicky and thinking that it's not going to get there, number one. And so he, uh, so he, he bought them at uh, right around 11. And then when it hit 09, he's thinking it's going to keep on going, of course. <laughs> he sold it out for a two tick loss. It bounced off nine, went back up to, <laughs> Went back up to 19, okay, and then he did the exact same thing. You know, came back to the office and was thoroughly exasperated and frustrated with, you know, with what happened, right? So the next day he went down there and did the exact same thing. And uh, and uh, <laughs> and and then after that, I, I didn't hear from him, and I didn't hear from him because he didn't want to have to account to me for the fact that he couldn't do this. Because you know, we're, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a hundred buck risk. That was it. I mean, this is, I mean, this is gen really genuinely less than chump change for this guy. So, uh, uh, so I didn't hear from him for about two weeks, and then I get a call. Well, as it turned out, after two or three weeks, maybe maybe three weeks, after two or three weeks, what had happened is that he had gotten pretty good at identifying support and resistance, and he had also gotten pretty good at buying them at nine, let's say, or selling them at 19, but he was still getting out at 10 or 11 and not holding on you know, for the full range. So he's only getting a one to two tick profit. And what was really exasperating for him is that in many cases, enough, it turned out that 09 in this example was the low of the day. Or he'd look back at the end of the day and say, you know what? I bought the low of the day and only got one tick. I bought the high of the day and only got one tick. So his solution to the problem, what do you think his solution was? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not double up, triple up. Okay, he's a one lot trader and I was going to be trading 25 
or 50 lots, okay? And actually, he'd made some money. He'd made some money in, in, in that two or three weeks. Now, he'd made maybe a couple thousand dollars doing this. So yeah, now the problem is, you know, going from a one lot trader in the pit to doing 20 or 25 or more, you're dealing with a whole different range or a whole different set of people. And, you know, it's just not easy to step up from one to 20. It's just based on the dynamics of the way the pit itself works. And I knew he was gonna get his ass handed to him. There wasn't a doubt in my mind about it. I didn't say anything to him. And uh, I say, hey, yeah, hey, go ahead. <laughs> and so <laughs> it wouldn't have made any difference if I said anything to him or not. So, uh, and that's exactly what happened. He, he lost all the profits he made plus another two or $3,000. And then he said, okay, like this, okay, I'm ready. What do I need to do? Based on the formula I just gave him, what would you tell him to do? You tell me now, if you're in this situation, you're in my shoes, and he's asking me, what, do, what does he need to do to resolve this problem? What? That's right. Why can't you want to stay in his winning trade? What's the process? We know the challenge. What, create a process. Break the process down to its most, the smallest incremental steps. Because this is the stuff you're going to need, need to do on your own anyway. You tell me what I told him. Well, you're close, but there, well, I added one other dimension. Louis close. What, what, other, what other dimension, let's say, or, fact, or factor or criteria did I add to originally what I told him to do that would, that, that would solve this problem, if he'll do Maybe it? Maybe move the stop, sell half, the stop here. Sell what? Sell half. Sell half? Well. No, we're going back to what Louis said. Go back to trading one contract. Oh, okay. okay. You move the stop, you never feel comfortable. You trade the stop, the stop moves, so you don't risk giving back everything. Uh, that's a real tough thing to do. You know, you're, you're, we're talking about a pretty small range in the first place, and, and a lot of the up-down movement in, a, in an eight-tick range is just going to be noise. So you'll end up you'll end up getting. You can't. I don't think you could do a trailing stop in this kind of a situation. You, you trailing stop, you got to give the market a little bit of room. Use trailing stops when you're trading higher time frames. So that that would be. I don't think that would be difficult. And I'm not a big fan of trailing stops anyway. But we'll tell you why later. You gotta do it 20 times. That's what it ingrains pattern. Uh, well, yeah, but there's if you add one other factor to this, that would not. What we want to do is this. Keep in mind that what what we're dealing with is, is is mental energy. We're dealing with conflicting energy, energy that conflicts with his desire or goal to hang on to that trade. Right. That's all we're really talking about. When he buys support, we do not know if it's going to even going to get up to get up to resistance. But the whole idea was it doesn't really matter because all he's really risking to find out is a hundred bucks anyway. So it's either it gets there or he gets stopped out. If it gets there he reverses or and it gets down here or he gets stopped out, one or the other. But if you add one other dimension to this, it will that that could force him to confront these conflicting forces. Because in essence all we're really talking about is petting the dog. This distance right here is the dog. Now we know the kid as a child, you, you know, it would be almost impossible to teach a kid this kind of a process where, where not impossible, but it would be difficult because they wouldn't understand the underlying dynamics. But with an adult at, at least, you can say, okay, here's the situation, here's what you, here's, here's the resistance, let's say, that you want to neutralize that means you're going to have to confront it. What would cause or force him or cause him, if he wanted to, to confront that resistance on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? Add one other factor, one other rule in here, and, 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 and the process goes really quick. Can you think of anything? Write down what his thoughts are. No, he's in the pit. He, uh -uh. Will he accept the loss? Uh, well, Th that's something we're going to work on. That's something that, that's going to that's going to happen as part of this process. Well, he never tells us the belief that he has uh, conflict with, right? Not really, no. But it, it, we really, in this case, we don't even have to know what the belief is. We don't even have to know why he can't hang on. I mean, I know why he can't hang on, but it doesn't make any difference. Whether he knows or I know, it doesn't make any difference. You can actually think of a process that would that would cause it to all go away. 
by doing something. Anybody think of anybody come to any anything come to mind? Walk out of pit until his price comes back. Close, very good. Stop order? No, walk out. No, I didn't tell him to walk out of the pit. Quite the contrary. However, it's, you're close by adding time. Adding a time dimension. In other words, the market comes down to nine. He gets in. He doesn't get stopped out. He's got to stay in that trade for let's say 10 or 15 minutes or it hits his point or whatever comes first. So in other words, what I wanted him to do was actually get into this trade, turn around and look at the clock and deal with his uncomfortableness, moment by moment, second by second. And the more that he could do it, the more that he could, let's say, be in that, in that uncomfortableness, the faster the, the energy neutralized. Because if he didn't get stopped out, then basically he was in a winning trade. And he was letting the market unfold in his favor. And the, and the more that the market unfolded in his favor, he was, actually, he was actually creating an experience that directly conflicted with his resistant energy. Just like as, remember yesterday the example that all dogs are dangerous? Not all dogs are dangerous, okay? As the, okay, we've got energy dynamics. So the more that he faced that clock and faced his uncomfortableness second by second, minute by minute, the faster the energy dissipated. So if he could only do it five minutes the first time, well, great. Maybe the next time he could do it six, and the next time he could do it 10, and the next time he could do it all 15. And then at some point, it didn't matter. He could do it. It was simple. It really was. It was a simple exercise. Not easy to do, but it was a simple exercise. That's basically what you guys are going to be doing for any trading skill. You're going to think of a process, break the process down to its smallest incremental steps, and do the steps. Because you, are, you don't have to know, you know, in many cases, you do not have to know what the conflicting energy is. On the self-sabotaging beliefs, you're, you're, you know, these are exercise, you know, the kind of things you're going to need to do to neutralize self-sabotaging beliefs. In some cases, you're going to have to know what it is. But in some of the, the trading skills that you need, the basic fundamental trading skills, you don't necessarily have to know. But you do have to create a process to neutralize it. And this is a perfect example of what I mean about using your trading to accumulate skills. He was trading. But he was trading for the specific purpose of being able to hang on to a winning trade. Now, if you have a problem hanging on to a winning trade, you know what? This exercise would work for you too. Jake? <laughs> 15 minutes. Though. The maximum is 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh, yes, you may. What is the belief? <laughs> I mean, I have, I have the same damn problem, but what, and, and, and we'll try that, but what if you dealt with the belief? Uh, what is the typical belief that keeps people out of winning trades? So it's simple as what you have. Well, in his case, it's because, he, because he'd been burned so many times, you know, where the market came back and took his profits away, where he didn't take it, because he never had a consistent or method, methodical way of taking profits. That's all it really was for him. It's just his past experience of being burned so many times. Where he thought the market was burning him, of course, it was his own, it was own, his, his inability to trade consistently or have a consistent methodology that was burning him. Go ahead, Greg. Um, <clears throat> being patient is one of my challenges. Let me use this example. If it starts going up to 15, you know, uh, I have this. I got a solution for you later on. Okay. What time is it? Okay, where'd we leave off? Anybody remember? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, I, I left off with, with the exercise. That was it. About, about creating processes. Yeah. Anyway, he, uh, 
he went on to uh, he went on to make uh, quite a bit of money trading bonds, and then went to uh, Thailand in the late. 80s and not early 90s to trade their stock exchange and um, and took advantage of a lot of people down over there. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> and uh, I kind of lost touch with him about probably about eight, nine years ago, so I don't really know where he's at right now. Um, okay, you've got, you've got information. Now, I want to precede uh, what I'm about to tell you right now with, with kind of a a caveat or warning. Um, I'm just exposing you to technologies and or, or ideas or let's say methodologies that you can use, but I suggest that you don't, until you've acquired some sophistication in working with us in these areas and, and expertise, that you do this with somebody who knows what they're doing, a professional. Well, I'm going to tell you, you'll see in a minute, OK? Uh, what I'm doing is, all I want to do is I want to give you, the, give you an idea of what's possible and the kind of things that you can do. Again, these are things you, you know, you're certainly under no obligation to do any of this stuff. Uh, but if you do decide to do it, I strongly, very strongly recommend that you do it with a professional, someone who knows what they're doing. Here's what I mean. We left off doing journal work writing questions, getting answers, discovering yourself, and, and discovering things that, you know, that uh, hopefully will pique your curiosity to ask another question. You're accumulating all this information about yourself. What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to go with it? Well, there are a number, again, there's a number of different things that you can do, a number of different techniques or technologies. <coughs> there are all kinds of self-help books that you can buy. Uh, you know, one of the things when people even ask me to suggest certain books, I, I'm a little red, reticent to do so. What I suggest that people do, instead of me recommending what book might be good for you, you find out what book is good for you by going to, you know, a pretty large self-help bookstore and finding out by just what book resonates, okay? As you're going, you know, as you're, you're perusing all these books that tell you what you can do and how you can do it and everything else like that, which books resonate? Which books are you attracted to? Books, books, in, in, in essence, because once you open yourself up, here again, this process of opening yourself up by asking questions, you will be naturally guided from this area right down here. You will be naturally guided to pick up the book that's, that's right for you in that moment. And that's the one you buy. And that's the one you start with. Stores because I was just in training and Larry's book almost fell off the shelf and hit me on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody pushed How me. I made a million dollars. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that in many cases, the, the kind of stuff that, that's going to happen once you open yourself up will seem quite magical. It really will. They'll just come into your life, you'll be attracted to it. You're not thinking about, you know, not, not analyzing, not judging. You just find yourself picking up this book and go, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this looks good. That's the one you buy. The one that feels good is the one you buy. See, so for me to recommend a book, it's like I'd have to, you know, tap into where you're at and, you know, and I mean, it's not that I haven't done that sort of thing, but it's just that you're better off just doing it on your own. Does that make sense, everybody? So, one of the things that you can do, and 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 this this kind of this is an example of um, of a trader that I worked with a, a while back, and um, uh, who had a uh, pretty abusive uh, relationship with his father, and it it hampered. He was a well, not yet. I'm not going to tell you what where he traded or what the deal was. But anyway, um, uh, he found a lot of the things that he had learned as a result of his relationship with his father quite troublesome, not only in his life, but of course, for his trading. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you uh, an exercise that I gave to him. 
and basically this exercise you can see this is his work right here it's about uh, 20 some pages or more it's all single space typewritten and these are experiences that he wrote about with his dad okay and and the exercise was to write the experience and then boil the experience down to um, in other words, distill it down to like a couple of sentences about, about what he learned about the nature of his relationship with the world as a result of these experiences, and then boil it down to a one sentence belief if possible. Because what, what we want to do when we're, when we're working with these kinds of, uh, when, when, you know, with these kinds of um, beliefs that we want to neutralize, we want to distill it down as, you know, as as much as possible so that we have something tangible to work with. Because when we've got something tangible to work with, there's even another exercise that I'll give you, again, that, I, that I'm going to caution you to use, not on your own, but with, you know, with guidance and with help, that will help you neutralize that one sentence concept when you get it down to that. But basically, what this exercise is about is this, is that you're not going to change your memories of your experiences. It's not the actual memory that you're changing, but you're going to change the context of the memory. In other words, you can put the memory into another framework from negative to positive. Because remember that, you know, remember that, that life, the universe, life, okay, offers us a range of experiences. And this line cannot represent that range of experiences because those experiences are virtually infinite. Now think about this. Those experiences are infinite. And every moment is truly unique. But if we start out with, you know, a particular experience in a particular category <coughs> from a negative perspective, we will continue to perpetuate that negative cycle over and over and over again until we break the cycle, which means it's something that we have to choose to do. We will think that cycle is reality, just like the boy and the dog example. Dogs had a range of experience, a range of possibilities to experience <laughs> happiness, joy, satisfaction. These are all states of mind. This child can only perceive one possibility out of a range of possibilities. That one possibility was his reality and something that he would vehemently defend as being the true and only reality. So I could say that every negative cycle that exists in each of our lives, and all of us have them, because none of us grow up pain-free. Nobody grows up pain-free. Everyone gets hurt emotionally. Everyone. And the problem is, if we don't reconcile our own pain, we will pass it on to our children. We have no other choice. As much as you might want to try not to, and even be conscious of it, Unless you have a way to reconcile the pain, you will pass it on. And then your children will pass it on to their children. And it'll keep on getting passed on until somebody decides to break the cycle. And the cycles don't get broken until somebody, like I said, decides until makes a conscious choice to work on it. Now, you don't have to, again, you don't have to change the memory because you couldn't anyway really I mean I guess people can they can you know they can create another memory and try to deny the, the original one but you can put it into a different context you can put something from from a, po from a negative into a positive context if for an example as in this case as in this particular person if he were to go back and had a way let's say or even imagine a way of accessing the child the person that he was when these experiences happened and explained these experiences in a different context, in a context that wasn't emotionally painful, well, you think that might be helpful? Because that's in essence what he's doing. He's explaining these experiences in a context that would help this, let's say, eight or nine year old create a set of memories about this that even though the actual experience themselves didn't change, the context of the experience changed from negative to positive. Because there's something else, another dynamic here that, that you need to really understand, 
and that's the dynamics of forgiveness. People generally think of forgiveness as doing something like to forgive the kind of pain that someone else perpetrated on us. Now, there's no doubt about the fact that, let's say, we, we interacted with someone in a very painful way, and let's say even if, even if it was intentional on their part, that you know the pain exists, it's there. But here's the problem, or here's the way that, uh, it, but here's the way that I'm going to give you a way to think about this that would help you help you work through some of this pain so that you can clean your mind out of negative energy so that you can live your life in a you know, more happy and satisfying way. Because people will say, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. And as much as that might be true, there's something that everyone needs to consider. And that's, let's take an example of a person in our lives, okay? Let's take mother, father, brother, sister, whatever. A relative we can say that that person has a range of expression that that let's say let's say that for the sake of this argument or this discussion that that particular person exists in a finite way all their inherent qualities and characteristics can be described in some sort of finite way all their memories all their experiences all the energy that's inside of them they exist in some way that can be described. So we've got them that exists outside of us, and then we have our representation of them. Okay, the representation of them that exists in our mind. In other words, some component part of our identity that we would describe as them. First of all, I would ask you, is our representation of them, them? Is it who they are? No. It can't be, right? Right. In other words, it's something less than, because for, the, for us to know them as who they are, we'd have to know them as their consciousness. We'd have to be, literally be them, in every, every aspect or every component part of who they are. So any way that we would represent somebody else is less than who they are, and usually much less than who they are, some small part. But it is a, com but it is a component part of our identity, meaning that that representation of that person, this unique representation, is a unique representation of that person exists nowhere else in the universe. Now think about that. You've got brothers and sisters or other relatives that have their own mental representation of that person that may have similarities to yours, but your representation is unique. It exists no other place, no other place in the universe other than your mind. And the problem that people have is that we have, this, we have this tendency to think that our representation of another person is that person, when in fact, if it's the only representation of that person, in other words, the only place that it exists is in our mind, it's really part of our identity. It's not them, it's us. That's the way you need to think of it. Any representation that you have of another person in your mind is part of your identity. And if that representation is a negatively charged energy, then it's having a negative effect on your life. We're the ones that are going to be suffering. Because what do we know about the nature of beliefs? They demand expression. See, so, so we grow up, let's say, with parents who are, let's say, inflict their own style or whatever of abuse, whether it was intentional or not, we say to ourselves, I'll never do that to my kids, and find ourselves doing just exactly the same thing to our kids. Why? Because all beliefs demand expression. And find ourselves being, in many ways, exactly the same way. Matter of fact, if you go to a relationship kind of a, a conference or a certain relationship, you know, conferences that you can go to or workshops you can go to to help you, you know, understand the nature of relationships and get more intimate and all this kind of stuff. Well, there are some that you can go to that uh, before, well, once you get there, let's say there's a room of maybe 100 people or so, when you get there, they'll give you these extensive personality inventories or characteristic inventories. 
and not only of yourself, but also how would you, how would you, you would describe your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wife. And then after you take all the inventories, uh, after everyone's done with all of that, you're in the, you know, you're, you're a part of the audience and you're asked, you, you, everyone has a turn, and you're asked without knowing anyone else in the audience now. You really even have, let's say you might have just maybe, maybe briefly met a few people, but otherwise, you are asked to go into the audience for the sake of the work that you're gonna do later on and pick, pick a dad, pick a mom, pick a wife, pick a brother, pick a sister, pick you know, a daughter or, or, or a son. And then what they do later on is they compare your description of your, you know, your relatives that you picked with the description of the way these people describe themselves. And people, you will find that you will just naturally pick. You're, you will be attracted to the energy that's inside of you. Meaning you will pick a mom and a dad that has characteristics almost virtually exactly like what you described your mother and father to be. And these are perfect strangers. People say opposites attract? No, that's not true. Likes attract. Like energy attracts like energy. It may seem on the surface as if people are opposite, but it isn't the case. I've worked with, with enough couples where it's like, I've just it just just it just blew my mind how on the surface two people looked. I mean, I if you'd asked me to describe it, I'd say there there is there is a far part is what people could be, and then the more that I worked with them, the more I found that underneath the facade and underneath the surface they were two peas in a pot. They were exactly the same. So what I'm saying is that. The idea, the notion, or the, you know, the concept of forgiveness is that you're not forgiving that person outside of you. It's not for their benefit. It could be. You could make it for their benefit, but I'm saying you don't have to. It's for your benefit. Because any negative energy inside of us has the potential to express itself in negative ways. Not only in the way that we see the world, not only in the way that we interact with other people, but also th just the effect that it has on our own physiology. Th does this make sense to people? Other people are not other people. Anyone that we perceive in our environment is some limited version of who they are which means that we can't perceive in other people what's not inside of ourselves. It's impossible. We cannot perceive in other people what's not inside of ourselves. Otherwise, that characteristic or trait that may exist in them is invisible to us until it's inside of us so that we can then, it acts as a force on our senses so that we can recognize it. 